This is the summary of How Successful People Think by John C. Maxwell's. Introduction. There is purpose in just thinking, not multitasking or trying to brainstorm an idea while waiting to pick up your lunch, but dedicating time to sitting and pondering. We shouldn't designate thinking time to only gaps in our schedules, such as daily commutes. The point is not just more thinking but better thinking, and this means no multitasking. Instead, we should establish a thinking place and a routine to follow. If we have good ideas, we need to dedicate time to shaping them and creating an action plan. Being a good thinker isn't restricted by job, education, or background. There's not a certain degree or course of study required to become a better thinker. Engagement in the process and the discipline to change are the key factors needed, although finding a comfy, quiet place surrounded by inspiration can help move the process along. To bring more thinking into your life and become a better thinker, follow these five pointers. 1. Find sources of inspiration and knowledge. Read articles relevant to your industry and find work you admire. While doing your own work, keep these inspirational sources in the front of your mind or physically in front of you for extra motivation. 2. Surround yourself with good thinkers. Talk to your friends who have a thought process you admire or who excel in their industries. 3. Actively choose good thoughts. Set aside and prioritize time specifically for thinking through problems or ideas. 4. Take action. Develop a sense of urgency about putting your ideas into action. 5. Listen to your gut responses. Monitor how you feel when things are going well. In How Successful People Think, John C. Maxwell not only covers the importance of deliberate thinking, but also identifies 11 different types of thinking and how you can incorporate them in your journey toward successful thinking. This snapshot dives into the details of eight of those key methods. Cultivate Big Picture Thinking Big picture thinking is exactly what you think it is. You understand the greater scenario while simultaneously breaking it down and gaining perspective from the individual parts. In other words, it's seeing both the forest and the trees and understanding that there are lessons in everything. Big picture thinking requires a change in both mindset and methods. To get in the right mindset, think of yourself as an eternal student who's always learning and widen your focus to open yourself up to new areas. When it comes to methods, listen more than you talk and actively identify learning opportunities in every experience or conversation. Big picture thinkers understand that being open to new experiences is essential. Do you prefer absolute silence during your Uber rides? Instead, try talking to your next driver. Do you turn down the opportunity to go rock climbing because you think you won't be good at it? In that case, rock climbing is exactly what you should do on your next day off. Humans are conditioned to become uneasy about the unknown, it's a survival instinct to run away from feelings of discomfort. However, to succeed at your goals, you should always embrace the unknown as having potential. Engage in focused thinking. When was the last time you had two hours to yourself with nothing to do but mull over an idea? If your response is never or not for a very long time then you're like most people. Focused thinking involves putting your blinders on and blocking out all outside distractions so you can hone your attention to your thinking process. With focused thinking, you put one goal or task above all others. Narrowing your focus allows the idea to incubate, which is necessary for staying on target and potentially expanding your idea once the basics are in place. For example, if you hope to open your own business, an important first step would be establishing a business plan and purpose before you start looking for a storefront or hiring employees. Start by prioritizing your ideas. Think about your strengths and weaknesses and assess your talents. Knowing these traits will help you move toward the right ideas and goals. Once you have your ideas, block out time specifically for thinking. Also, specify exactly what you'll do during that time. Now it's time to engage in focused thinking. This is when the mental blinders come into play. To get in the groove, remove all distracting temptations. Leave your phone in another room and install a website blocker to avoid online rabbit holes. Put visuals in front of you, like a to-do list or the specific paperwork you need to complete. Focusing this intensely may sound unattainable, especially since we all carry smartphones that can interfere with ideas before they have a chance to grow. Whether they're for work or play, email, social media applications, and addictive games make it difficult to focus. But you don't necessarily need a sensory deprivation tank or a blank room to make focused thinking happen. Employ realistic thinking. When you think of a realist, you probably think of a character who's the voice of reason. Realists are often portrayed as the wise best friend, the coach who gives tough love, or the mentor trying to guide the hero through unfamiliar territory. 
they're practical and like to see proof before accepting or believing in something. Sometimes, they can even be a bit stubborn. Realistic thinking is something like the scientific method. Steps are defined, there's a control group, and the goal is to build a baseline process or idea that can be replicated. This type of thinking helps identify attainable goals and defines the steps or milestones needed to reach those goals. Realistic thinking is all about assessing and minimizing risk, knowing where things can go awry, and identifying backup plans just in case. Thinking realistically doesn't have to be boring. In fact, a baseline plan can provide a jumping-off point for creativity. Returning to the example of running your own small business, realistic thinking helps you identify the amount of work you'll need to do or the number of products you'll need to sell to pay all your expenses and turn a small profit. From there, you can determine where to make room for more creative projects. Additionally, it's important to note that realistic thinking is not pessimistic. Preparing for things to go wrong doesn't mean you're convinced that disaster is the only outcome. Instead, acknowledging where things could go wrong and taking steps to prevent it will help you succeed in the long run. Overall, realistic thinking emphasizes focusing on the facts and recognizing the pros and cons in everything, while having a backup plan or escape plan, just in case the worst happens. Utilize strategic thinking. Some people naturally love planning and outlining details. Think about the talents of project managers, event planners, and marketing professionals. All these roles involve anticipating needs or direction changes and making sure everyone involved is ready to adjust. Many people in these positions are strategic thinkers. They anticipate needs, prepare for difficulty, have several plans ready, and embrace uncertainty. There's always a chance that it will rain on a bride's dream wedding day or that a project will receive negative feedback and must pivot to get back on track. Customizing their planning with flexible processes instead of rigid structure allows these thinkers to embrace uncertainty. If you find it difficult to plan, you may not understand strategic thinking. Is it magic? Delusional confidence? No. Strategic thinkers define objectives up front, break problems or goals into smaller pieces, and divide and conquer. Strategic thinkers also continually seek more information and clarity, as information is power when it comes to being flexible and embracing many possible outcomes. Learn from reflective thinking. In our fast-paced lives, it may seem impossible to slow down and reflect on the past, but that is exactly what's behind reflective thinking. This type of thinking prioritizes analyzing past events or ideas from projects that have already wrapped up. How is it possible to innovate for the future if you're focusing on what's already happened? By taking the time to think about what you've already accomplished and why you succeeded or failed, you gain an improved perspective on the deeper meanings of experiences and how you responded to them. This enables you to engage in better decision-making and have more confidence in the big picture. Many thinking methods discussed in the book involve widening your horizons and treating every opportunity as a potential learning experience, and the same can be said for thinking about past events. Whether something succeeded or failed, you can add that experience to your portfolio and learn from it. Reflective thinking can be applied in many areas of your life and incorporated into your regular workflow. For example, you could schedule reflective thinking at the end of a big project, or you could schedule time for it at regular intervals during a long-term project. At meetings that are often humorously referred to as post-mortems, a team sits down at the end of a project to have an open conversation about the good, the bad, and the ugly. You can also block out the time for your own reflective thinking. During this time, ask yourself a series of questions and answer honestly. Examples of self-reflective questions include. 1. How did I make a positive impact today? How could I improve? 2. Did I lead well today? How did my team respond? 3. What do I need to spend more time on? Then, write an analysis on how you plan to change your actions in the future. Question popular thinking. While reading about the different ways of thinking, you may have some doubts about how each method applies to you. You may think, I won't find any benefit in that, so it's not worth my time. This is an example of popular thinking. Using conventional thoughts against yourself. Time is a popular excuse for not prioritizing thinking, you just don't have time. Popular thinking isn't particularly helpful and can impede progress. And this is precisely why you should question it. When you start to break it down, this type of thinking is designed to be mindless, as it removes the need for active decision-making. Instead, you simply rely on popular opinion or thought. By taking away decisions, popular thinking encourages only average outcomes. This is why our standards for measuring the success of outcomes are rooted in the most common expectations, instead of what's actually possible. 
In addition, popular thinking doesn't suit change. The status quo changes at a snail's pace because change is often viewed as disruption. In itself, questioning popular thinking is an act of rebellion. If you want to change standards and expand possibilities, it's essential to think for yourself. Don't go along with what others are doing, instead, question why things are the way they are. Explanations such as that's the way it's always been done or the dreaded because I said so do not justify aversion to change. Even your own ideas are not exempt, you should question yourself too. Think for yourself by exploring new methods, embracing discomfort, and appreciating other innovative thinkers. Benefit from shared thinking. Teamwork makes the dream work, and this includes team thinking. While many thinking methods are designed as solo activities, shared thinking is essential for any collaborative effort, where you work with others while expanding your own understanding of your ideas. You may associate group projects with bad experiences you had in school. Or you may just prefer flying solo. If this is the case, it can be tricky to open yourself to shared thinking. But shared thinking inevitably makes your ideas stronger, and it's the only way to gauge whether your ideas benefit the greater good or just yourself. Aim to work with people who have experience in arenas you're unfamiliar with. Listening to them provides invaluable knowledge that can transform your ideas in surprising ways. This process will also strengthen your relationships, increase innovation by adding many perspectives, and divide the work for better efficiency. Practice unselfish thinking. You don't need to be a saint to practice unselfish thinking. Shared thinking emphasizes using the perspectives of others to improve your ideas. Unselfish thinking takes this to another level by prioritizing others' perspectives and goals in your process. Starting your own unselfish thinking process requires these essential steps. 1. Put others before you. Prioritize looking out for the interests of others before thinking of your own stake in a situation. 2. Build awareness of needs. Discover what needs there are in your area of expertise, beyond what you're already aware of. 3. Give, without expecting reward. Give without expecting any acknowledgement or reward in return, such as by making an anonymous donation. 4. Invest beyond yourself. Give for the sake of enriching someone else's well-being or development. 5. Evaluate your motives. Check in regularly to make sure you're thinking like a giver and not expecting something in return. In addition to helping someone else, unselfish thinking yields benefits for you. And appreciating this doesn't make you selfish. Helping others increases your sense of personal fulfillment, especially when you're able to perform a service or provide a perspective someone else can't provide. It can also lead to a positive domino effect. You're more motivated to help others, and those witnessing your actions are inspired to do the same. Engaging in this process inevitably leads you to incorporate even wider impacts into your ideas and goals, instead of focusing only on yourself. Conclusion. In this snapshot, you've learned not only the importance of setting aside time exclusively for thinking, but also the different types of thinking that can help you in problem solving, goal setting, and many other areas of life. Remember, the fundamental keys to better thinking are engagement in the process and the discipline to change. In addition, try to surround yourself with sources of inspiration, as well as other good thinkers. Actively choose good thoughts and prioritize those ideas as the ones to pursue and put into action. The book offers many examples of how to think big and expand your thinking based on your work and previous life experiences. The ideal scenario is to use a healthy mix of all the different types of thinking. While this may seem to be a daunting task, it's a goal to work toward as you learn to prioritize time for careful thought and become a more successful thinker. This is the summary of Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Introduction Marcus Aurelius was a second-century Roman emperor whose career was plagued by natural disasters, violence, and political upheaval. While Aurelius climbed to prominence almost 2,000 years ago, his writings are still relevant today and offer modern audiences insight into how a revered leader managed to do his job amid incredibly stressful circumstances. The following sections of this summary explore some of the emperor's wisdom for maintaining personal peace and enjoying life in an unpredictable world. Dealing with people. When you begin each morning, make peace with the fact that you'll spend much of your day dealing with irritating, incompetent characters. Humans are imperfect, and it's inevitable that you'll cross paths with the arrogant, the unkind, and the annoying. Your colleague in the neighboring cubicle will chew his gum with his mouth open. Your Uber driver will have body odor. A male coworker will talk over you during a meeting, or your mother will continue to call with unsolicited advice about your love life. 
Remember that humans are social creatures by nature, so when socializing, these realities are unavoidable. Injustice, pain, and irritation are simply the way of life, and you'll be better off if you make peace with these disturbances instead of letting them cause you angst at every turn. Anxiety. Life is unfathomably short. Death hangs over you in every moment, and you must face the fact that its arrival will be random. You might go through your day minding your endless to-do list, only to be hit by a bus. You might spend the present moment worrying about your future, only to discover a lump in your breast. Consider the people who came before you in life. They spent just as much time carefully planning their choices or worrying about their finances, yet, death claimed them anyway. Your situation is no different. In each moment, remember that your time on this planet is increasingly brief. Therefore, don't worry about the future or about events that are outside of your control. Do whatever is in your power and be happy about it while you can. Fame. Everyone desires their own form of fame. Perhaps you want to be the employee who devises a revolutionary idea that will change your company. Perhaps you want to write a best-selling book that will receive rave reviews. Or perhaps you simply want to be the kind of parent that your child will love and cherish, even after you pass on. However, you'll be a far happier person if you banish these ideas from your mind and stop worrying about fame, as this is the wrong use of your ambition and energy. Consider all the famous writers, inventors, and leaders who came before you. In your mind, the world wouldn't exist as it does without their unique contributions. Yet those celebrities met the same fate that every other human must eventually encounter, they all disappeared into death. Fame cannot save you from this inevitability. Also, consider that memory is relatively limited. Do you really know anything about your great-great-grandmother? Will people be talking about Martin Scorsese in 200 years? Even the most exciting public figures of the present recede into the blind oblivion of history. If fame is your goal, you'll never attain what you seek. Even if you do manage to make it big, everyone will still forget about you eventually. But don't let this fate depress you, rather, let it be a reminder to take it easy. Whatever you do in life, you have the freedom to do it because you love it. Run for local office because you love kissing babies. Make a movie because you love the process of collaborating with actors. Write a book because you enjoy getting lost in the psychology of your characters. Once you let go of the false promises of fame, you can live for love instead. Let go. You contain three basic components, a body, the contents of your life, and your mind. You're obligated to take care of all these components. Do your best to stay healthy by eating wisely and exercising. Do your best to take care of your family and honor your vocation. Do your best to go to therapy, show yourself some compassion, and improve your intelligence. However, don't mistakenly assume that your perfect efforts will lead to a perfect life. Even if you do all the right things, like yearly checkups or regular exercise, you might end up with a terminal diagnosis. Even if you work really hard at the office, you might get laid off. Your best efforts won't influence the random twists of fate that pervade human existence, and your life might go haywire, even if you manage to make all the right choices. The only aspect of yourself that you can truly control is your mind. You have the power to observe the way you think. You can observe your tendency to hold grudges or feed on anger. You can go to therapy and address your recurring pattern of playing the victim. You can choose to be better informed on current events or to improve your intellect by reading more summaries. Your attitudes, emotions, and mental patterns are under your control, so use that power to improve in any way you can. Don't waste time fretting about the aspects of your life that are impossible to change. Instead, direct your energy to the part of yourself that is within your power. Use your head. The circumstances of your life will never be sources of contentment and peace. You can't rely on an elusive promotion or a perfect relationship to make you feel whole. If your workday is full of chaos or your home is a source of stress, you don't need new circumstances in order to find peace. Instead, you can find peace in your own mind. Every person has the power to retreat into their mind. You can take a deep breath, close your eyes, and experience stillness, even if you're surrounded by anxious co-workers and arguing children. Serenity is always accessible, and you don't need to alter your circumstances to attain it. If life feels stressful and disorganized, take a moment to reflect on your principles. Remember that your values and beliefs ought to be your highest priority. Focus your efforts on activities and relationships that are true to your ideals and let the rest fade away. 
Furthermore, remind yourself of the brevity of life and remember that suffering is inevitable. Instead of feeling resentful about your circumstances, accept them as an unavoidable part of life and move on. The most authentic satisfaction comes from within. You can be your own source of peace and contentment. Take care of your mind by paying attention to how it works and becoming mindful of your true priorities. If you can do this, your mind will ultimately take care of you. Other people. Don't worry about what other people do, say, or think. Remember that the stuff of life belongs to one of two categories, the things you can control and the things you can't control. Other people always fall into the latter category. You can't force a co-worker to like you or prevent your neighbor from letting their dog relieve itself on your property. These occurrences might feel irritating, but in the end, you can't control what people do. You can surprise your co-worker with an endless deluge of homemade baked goods, but they still might think that you're an inferior copywriter. You can report your neighbor to the neighborhood association and instigate a crusade against dog poop, but that still won't prevent a canine from squatting by your mailbox. Your energy and emotion will come to no avail. You'll be better off if you learn to let go of such anxieties and focus your energy on the parts of life that you can control. If you want to get into that co-worker's good graces, you can be courteous and diligent when you work together, but don't lose yourself in anxiety if your actions don't produce the intended consequences. You can talk to your neighbor about their dog, but don't let yourself fall into a downward spiral of loathing and resentment if that neighbor refuses to listen. Focus on your mind and find ways to be at peace with unpleasant circumstances. Getting out of bed. When your alarm goes off in the early hours of the morning and the rainfall against your roof makes you want to stay in bed instead of chasing the bus, tell yourself this, I rise to the work of a human being. Why are you on this planet? Are you here to be comfortable, to stay in bed all day eating hot pockets and re-watching every season of Mad Men? No. You're here to fulfill your calling. You're here too till your tiny corner of the universe. Are you a painter? Get out of bed and put something on a canvas. Are you an engineer? Get out of bed and write some code. Are you a writer? Get out of bed and summarize a book. You know what you're here for. You're here to be a human being so do what humans do. Live well. Take care of yourself and other people. Live according to your beliefs. Brush your teeth and put on real clothes instead of moping around the house in that unwashed bathroom. You have a body and brain so put them to use, and for God's sake, stop eating hot pockets. Judging the universe. The things that happen in life, such as hurricanes, layoffs, infidelity, or asteroids, are all natural occurrences. They just happen. They belong to the universe, and they're neither good nor bad. Resist the urge to judge the contents of your life. Don't give the universe the evil eye if a tree falls on your garage. Don't blame the forces that be if your lover stops loving you. Accept everything that happens to you, even if it's disagreeable and painful. The universe has given you this fate, so who are you to argue? Furthermore, the universe is indifferent. The hardships you suffer aren't a personal attack from the divine. They're just the way of life. Instead of judging the universe and becoming resentful because of your hardships, practice acceptance. Don't label certain events as good or bad, blessing or curse. Simply accept that they exist. Make peace with your life, however it happens to unfold. Justice. Take it upon yourself to exercise your power for the sake of others. Injustice and oppression are incorrect human behaviors, and to perpetuate an injustice is to act against yourself, for you damage the quality of your soul if you hurt other people. You must not only strive to act in the most just way, but also wield your power to alleviate oppression. This balance may feel difficult to strike. You might ask, how can I practice acceptance of the universe and work to change the world? The answer is that you must cherish both aims. Go to the capital to lobby for gun reform, but don't hate your life if you fail to influence legislation. Work as hard as you can to elect the first black female governor of your state, but don't fall into depression if her conservative opponent rigs the election in his favor. Hold on to your inner peace, even if things don't go your way. Change. Every change, even a positive one, can feel difficult. Your long-awaited promotion will come with new hours and responsibilities, and it might take time to get used to that. Getting married might be what you truly desire, but that won't make it any easier to find someone else's socks and toenail clippings around your house. Every good in life requires change. Seeds change to become consumable crops. You get smarter in order to get your degree. 
you outgrow your favorite shirt in order to become an adult. As you encounter the more difficult changes in life, remind yourself that change is the source of every good thing. Also, remind yourself that change is inevitable and stop fighting it. One more note on brevity. Life is short and it will be over before you know it. Stop worrying about anything and everything that's beyond your control. Stop fretting about the future and the opinions that other people hold. Focus your energy on your own business and don't let the uncontrollable elements of life ruin the precious time you have left. Conclusion. Much of life is and will continue to be outside of your control. Don't worry about the events and people that you can't change. Instead, work to influence the realms of life that are within your power. How you think and feel will always be under your control. Live as virtuously as you can and don't worry about the rest. Above all, remember that your time on this planet is brief so make the most of it. This is the summary of Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert T. Kiyosaki. Introduction. The rich stay rich and the poor stay poor because finances are taught at home. A talented brilliant individual can still struggle financially if they are raised with a poor mindset. Once there were two dads. They both excelled in their prospective careers, but one always struggled financially while the other prospered. These dads had very different opinions, one focused on getting an education, finding a great job, benefits, and security. The other focused on creating companies and wealth rather than working for them. One was a rich dad and the other was a poor dad. A financial education is far more powerful than money because money is fickle, it comes and goes. But if you understand how it works, you know how to get it back when it goes. You don't work for money, you make money work for you. Rich Dad teaches six main lessons about money, and they are as follows. Lesson 1. The rich don't work for money. Poor Dad was a teacher. He made decent money, but usually struggled to pay his bills. He claimed not to care about money, saying that he enjoyed teaching, and that was enough. Poor Dad was insistent that a good education and a great job are the keys to success. Rich Dad did not have an education, but he ran several successful companies around town. He believed that rich people make money work for them, while everyone else works for money. Rich Dad explained that most people are motivated by fear and desire. They fear not having enough or running out of money, and that fear motivates them to get a job and keep going back. When they get their paycheck, their desire kicks in as they imagine all of the things money can buy. Once they have spent their money, they feel the fear once again. And the cycle continues, while people become wage slaves, always dependent on a boss in a never-ending rat race. Fear and desire are emotions that can rule our lives. We can react to these emotions, or we can pause and think about our options. When you live your life according to emotional reactions to fear and desire, all you look for is a paycheck. Since that is all you look for, that's all you will ever see. Rich Dad wanted to see other opportunities, opportunities to let money work for him, not the other way around. Lesson 2. Why teach financial literacy? Wealth is not about how much money you make. It's about how much of that money you get to keep, and you can't understand how to keep your money without financial literacy. Poor Dad focused on a typical education, while Rich Dad prioritized a financial education. The foundation of your financial literacy is learning the difference between an asset and a liability, something most poor or middle-class individuals do not understand. The rich accumulate assets, which put money in their pockets. Everyone else acquires liabilities, which take money out of their pockets. Many people fall into a cycle of building liabilities without even realizing it. Home ownership is a great example. Many young couples assume that a home is a great asset, so they buy one, and then fill it with things, increasing their expenses. If they get more money through a promotion or an inheritance, they immediately buy a bigger home and begin the cycle all over again. Their home isn't providing money, it's costing money. Thus, it's a liability. This doesn't mean that buying a home is bad, it simply illustrates a major misunderstanding about financial literacy. The poor and middle class rely on an income solely through their salaries, and their expenses generally rise in proportion to their income. This creates the never-ending rat race of struggle and dependence. When a financially literate person wants to buy a home, they first buy assets that can pay for that home. Their salary isn't a factor. Once you increase your financial literacy by understanding the difference between a liability and an asset you will start to focus on acquiring assets instead of chasing a bigger salary. 
The money you make from your assets can buy all that you need, and anything left over can be reinvested into even more assets. Lesson 3. Mind your own business. Most people spend their lives working to make someone else rich. When your job is your only source of income, you are dependent on others and risk losing everything should things go south. Downsizing and recession are terrifying to most of the population because they work for someone else's business. Poor dad thought the road to success was working hard for someone else, but rich dad believed in minding his own business. Becoming wealthy requires that you mind your own business instead of someone else's. Your business is your assets, not your salary. This doesn't mean you should rush out and quit your job, but it does mean that you should begin buying real assets and continually growing them. If you want to become financially secure, reduce your expenses and liabilities while building your assets. In short, do the exact opposite of what most middle-class citizens do. For example, you could begin gathering real estate assets and receive passive income from rent payments. This way, you aren't dependent on a boss or a company for your income. Assets come in many different forms, from real estate to stocks to company ownership, but only if said company can operate without you, otherwise it's just work. Not every asset is right for every person. You will take better care of something you truly enjoy, so figure out which assets fit your personality and focus on those. You can keep being a great employee, but mind your own business as well. Lesson 4, The History of Taxes and the Power of Corporations. Poor dad knew a lot about history, but rich dad knew the history of taxes. Americans were originally anti-tax, but they eventually changed their tune. The idea was similar to Robin Hood, the rich would be taxed to support the poor. But the government soon needed more and more money, so the tax laws trickled down to the people who would suffer the most. Now, taxes are a burden on the middle class, but not on the rich, because they have found their way around taxes. When individual employees work, they have taxes taken out of their paychecks and then receive whatever is left over. Corporations, on the other hand, spend what they want on their pre-tax earnings and then are taxed on whatever they did not spend. The rich discovered this loophole and began forming corporations to hold their money. What many people don't realize is that corporations aren't necessarily big companies with employees in giant buildings, they are simply folders with a few legal documents. Having financial knowledge allowed the rich to find this loophole in the system, making them even more rich. Meanwhile, the financially illiterate middle class are forced to get by with whatever is left over after the government takes their portion. There are plenty of other loopholes that increase the wealth of whomever has the financial education to take advantage of them. Rich Dad believed that the longer and harder you work as an employee, the more you are losing to the government. As a young man, he used his corporate salary to buy more and more assets, and he created a corporation to hold those assets. Soon, Rich Dad was paying for the things he needed and wanted with his pre-tax corporation earnings, while his taxed salary was reinvested into more assets. Meanwhile, poor Dad struggled to make ends meet on the little he had left over after taxes. Lesson 5, The Rich Invent Money Throughout our lives we are told to work hard and save some of our money. This is certainly what poor dad advised. But rich dad had other ideas. Rich dad knew that simply working your whole life and setting aside a bit of money was missing out. In a fast-changing world, new opportunities to make money are popping up every single day. And, unlike in the past, we can now make money simply by our intellect and ideas. Rich dad advises financial literacy in order to notice, understand, and take advantage of all these opportunities. Instead of simply making money, financial intelligence allows us to invent money. The pillars of financial intelligence are accounting, investing, marketing, and the law. Knowledge of these pillars is what allows the rich to take advantage of tax loopholes like forming corporations. It is also what allowed rich dad to increase his wealth through unique opportunities that most miss out on because they are so focused on working hard and saving a little bit. For example, while most people are focused on saving money during depressed housing markets, the financially literate notice the opportunity and buy real estate at bargain prices. Accomplishing something like this requires knowledge, and many people would simply rather plug away at their jobs than expand their minds and grab new opportunities. Knowledge is power, and it is through financial knowledge that the rich invent money. Lesson 6, Work to Learn, Don't Work for Money. Poor dad spent his life specializing in a single field, but rich dad knew that specializing limits auctions. It may earn more money in the short term, 
but often it leaves you vulnerable when the market changes or the world evolves. Pardad spent his life getting more degrees in the same expertise, always chasing promotions that inevitably weren't enough. Eventually his career went south and he was forced to scramble for something else. His options were limited because he had spent so much time focusing on one single skill. Rich Dad sought new roles every time he mastered his previous one. His goal was to learn to manage a few key areas that are vital for financial success, cash flow, systems, and people. Some of the roles didn't offer a lot of money, but the knowledge he gained provided the long-term success he wanted. Rich Dad valued jobs for what you learn, not what you earn. There are countless brilliant and talented people in the world who will continue to struggle because they don't know anything outside their specialty. Often, all these people need is some knowledge of marketing or communications, but most of them view these extraneous subjects as a waste of time. Instead of learning a lot about one subject, learn a little about a lot of subjects. Work to learn, and you will have the skills for financial success. Overcoming Obstacles If you gain the necessary knowledge to be financially literate, there are still some roadblocks you may face. These obstacles often keep educated people from ever becoming wealthy. The first is fear. Most people fear losing their money, rich people included. The difference between the rich and poor is not fear, but what they choose to do with that fear. You can play it safe, or you can take big risks. You can let failures defeat you, or let them teach and inspire you. Financial winners use their failures to inspire more wins, and this makes them unafraid of losing. The next is cynicism. There will always be doubts, both in our minds and from the people around us. Those who are too afraid to take their own risks are more than happy to tell you not to take yours. But the wealthy overcome that cynicism. When everyone else is talking doom and gloom, they are taking advantage of depressed markets through excellent deals. Don't criticize, analyze. Another obstacle is laziness. This doesn't necessarily look like sitting on the couch all day and refusing to get a job. Often, the laziest people are very busy because they know this excuses them from making the effort in other areas. Poor people often claim, I can't afford it, which gives their minds an excuse to shut off. Instead of shutting down, they could ask, how can I afford this, and get their minds working on a solution. The last obstacle is arrogance. According to Rich Dad, what we don't know loses us money, and arrogance is the assumption that what we don't know isn't important. This means that when you are arrogant, you will lose. Fight ignorance and arrogance by actively seeking to educate yourself on the topics you don't understand. Getting started. If you want to learn how to free yourself of the rat race, there are some steps you can take on the road to wealth and independence. First, find a motivation bigger than yourself. The road to wealth isn't always easy, but if you have a personal, emotional reason for wanting to succeed, you will stay strong during the hard times. Next, reinforce your goals every day by remembering your motivation and speaking positively to yourself. Affirm your ability to find financial freedom. Choose your friends wisely. Cynical and fearful friends will start to drain your courage and motivation, but brave, financially intelligent friends will inspire you. You'll also have the opportunity to exchange ideas, and they will motivate you to always keep learning, an essential aspect of remaining successful. Most people pay all of their bills and creditors, leaving themselves with whatever is measly amount is left. But Rich Dad paid himself first. If there wasn't enough to go around, the pressure from his obligations inspired him to work harder or find creative ways to increase his income. Adopting this policy also forces you to think long and hard about the liabilities you're willing to take on. Use assets, rather than debt, to fund luxuries. Most people go out and get a loan when they want a bigger house or a new car, but this increases their liabilities and makes them desperately dependent on the rat race. Build up your assets and reward yourself with luxuries paid for by those assets. Finally, seek out a financial hero or several. You may know them personally or simply read their books and watch their speeches. Financial heroes can educate and motivate you to accomplish your goals. Conclusion Poor Dad thought a college degree, a good job, and hard work were the keys to success. Rich Dad valued education but he believed that a good education included a financial education. Poor Dad spent his life working for earned income and encouraged others to do the same. Rich Dad understood that earned income is only one avenue and that passive income and investment portfolios are the real keys to financial independence. Having your money work for you means building passive income. Most people believe that it takes money to make money 
But the truth is that money is just a concept. To make it, you only need your mind. One small idea can turn into something life-changing. Today, financial literacy is vital, not just for success but for survival. Do everything you can to educate yourself through books, classes, conferences, and mentors. Your greatest gifts are your mind and your time. Use them wisely. Educate yourself, acquire assets, and build a wealthy future. This is the summary of The 5 AM Club. Own Your Morning, Elevate Your Life by Robin Sharma. Introduction. The 5 AM Club is a parable about success, not mere financial or professional success but true success. The kind of success that will make you into a hero. Heroism sounds like a romantic ideal, but anyone can achieve it by embracing discomfort and putting intense focus into daily habits of self-improvement. The first habit is simple. Wake up at 5 AM and use the first hour of your day to get ahead. As you read, keep in mind the insights of the 5 AM Club. 1. Four focuses of history makers. Improve upon your natural talents, free yourself from distractions, master your craft, and build each day's successes on the last. 2. Habit installation. To create new habits, choose a trigger, a ritual, and a reward. Then, turn your habits into triggers for further habits. 3. The 2020th 20 formula. The first hour of your day should be split into 20 minute pockets of intense exercise, reflection, and study. 4. The 90 90th 1 rule. For 90 days, spend 90 minutes at the start of your day practicing the one most important skill for your field. 5. The 60 tenths method. For stellar productivity, work in cycles of 60 minutes of intense focus and 10 minutes of deep rest. 6. Traffic University. Spend your commute learning instead of allowing yourself to succumb to boredom. 7. Weekly design. The things you schedule are the things that will get done, so take 30 minutes every Sunday to design a beautiful week. A daily philosophy on becoming legendary. In the 5 AM Club parable, the artist and entrepreneur attend a seminar hosted by the Spellbinder. The Spellbinder lectures on the importance of mindset. Regardless of the tragedies of your past, it's possible to adopt a fearless mentality. Fear limits your success by paralyzing you into inaction, while taking action on your dreams is infinitely more important to success than just having those dreams. You must be willing to be uncomfortable in order to overcome your fears. In fact, your greatest opportunities will arise in the places where you're the most uncomfortable. At the end of his speech, the Spellbinder collapsed. Afterward, the artist and entrepreneur, two former strangers, stopped outside to chat about what had happened. There, they met a strange homeless man who seemed to know everything about what the Spellbinder had to teach and was not at all what he seemed. The homeless man expounded on the need to live a legendary life, spend your time with people who understand you, and do the things that fill you with joy. By surrounding yourself with the right personal and environmental influences, you can become infinitely more productive. Take Karen, for instance. Karen spent the first half of her 20s around people who avoided responsibility and partied. As long as she hung around them, she didn't see the point of attending school, even though she'd always dreamed of being a nurse. Eventually, she decided to give up partying and get into a nursing program. To do this, she had to make herself uncomfortable and lose some friends, but the joy, productivity, and new, more like-minded friends she found in nursing school exponentially improved her life. At the end of their conversation, the homeless man invited the artist and entrepreneur to his compound to learn more about how to elevate their lives. They accepted. The next morning, the artist and entrepreneur were picked up in a limousine to fly on a private jet to Mauritius. On the way, they were given five rules to remember. 1. Distraction kills creativity. 2. Excuses will never produce genius. 3. Change is hard at the start, messy in the middle, and beautiful at the end. 4. If you want to rise above others, you must challenge yourself more than they challenge themselves. 5. The point where you feel like giving up is exactly the point at which you should proceed toward your goals. The 5 AM Method. The Morning Routine of World Builders. As it turned out, the homeless man was actually Stone Riley, one of the richest men in the world and one of the Spellbinder's protégés. His first lesson for the artist and entrepreneur was to wake up at 5 AM every day. The early morning hours are when you can get a competitive edge. While most people sleep, you can build better habits, strategize, and get ready for a productive day, all without the distraction of daily life humming around you. 
rising early elevates every other good habit you can cultivate. That evening, the artist and entrepreneur bonded. The entrepreneur lost her father when she was young and was always afraid of abandonment. Worse still, the board of the company she founded and nurtured to astronomical success was threatening her life if she wouldn't leave the company. For his part, the artist had always been a dreamer, but when he was young, his parents and teachers had quashed his creativity. Since then, he had resented authority, but that resentment had taken over his life while failing to restore his childlike wonder for the world. These were the fears that limited Riley's new students. The next day, Riley taught the artist and the entrepreneur the importance of painstaking attention to detail in all their endeavors. By increasing your awareness of details, you get more information about what you're working on, and with that information, you can make better choices. And better choices lead to better results. Monique, for instance, led shifts in her local bakery. She was intimately familiar with her customers and what they wanted to see in stock, but like most of the bakery employees, she didn't track the customers' purchases. One day, she decided to spend some of her downtime digging into the bakery's point-of-sale system and tracking trends. She discovered patterns. More cream cakes sold on weekends, more marble cakes sold for special orders, and sales on vanilla and chocolate cakes had risen when she was piping floral patterns onto the top. By paying painstaking attention to details, she was able to create a production schedule that brought about a 20% sales increase. Next, Riley introduced the four focuses of history makers. Capitalization. This involves growing your natural talents. You can be innately gifted in a particular area, but that doesn't mean you should coast on that innate gift. Improving upon your gifts is what sets great people apart from others. It takes hard work and discipline to improve your gifts. Freedom from distractions. Distraction is an addiction, and it's deadly for creativity. The key is to radically simplify your life so that it contains only the things that are most important to you. Personal mastery practice. Every day, and particularly every morning, you should be practicing your skills and preparing your mind and body for the victories you want to achieve during the day. Day stacking. Every day's successes should build on the last. Small daily improvements build on each other. The important ingredient is consistency, making improvements every single day, without fail. The 5AM Club discovers the habit installation protocol. Riley took the artist and the entrepreneur to Agra to see the Taj Mahal and impart his knowledge about habits, specifically that you form habits through consistency and willpower. If you don't have much willpower to start with, it's okay. The more you exercise your willpower, the stronger it becomes, just like a muscle. The Taj Mahal serves as a useful metaphor for habit building. It took two decades for Emperor Shah Jahan to see the construction of the mausoleum through to its completion, but he stayed the course because he wanted to express to the world how much he loved his late wife. It's not enough just to build habits, you must both care deeply about the habit you're building and follow through on your plans. Habits have four steps. First, you must decide on a trigger that will remind you to practice the ritual you want to make into a habit, which is the second step. After practicing the ritual, the third step is to reward yourself for your practice. The fourth step is to repeat it. The beautiful thing about the habit installation protocol is that you can use it to turn habits into triggers for further habits, building success upon success. The 5AM Club learns the 2020th 20 formula. Riley then brought the artist and entrepreneur, who had fallen in love and gotten engaged, to Rome, where he had once fallen in love with his late wife. Here, he introduced them to the 2020th 20 formula. The way to allocate the extra hour you get when you wake up at 5 a.m. the first 20 minutes should be spent on immediate intense exercise as soon as you wake up. Exercise increases dopamine in your brain, setting you up for a positive productive mood and elevates your metabolism. The second 20-minute pocket should be spent on reflection. Journaling is a particularly good way to spend this time because it allows you to get some clarity on your thoughts and emotions before you head into the challenges you'll face during the day. The third and final 20 minutes should be spent on growth. This is a good opportunity to read, listen to podcasts, or work on an online course. The third pocket is where you make an investment in yourself. The 5AM Club is mentored on the tactics of lifelong genius. In Sao Paulo, the artist and entrepreneur got married. The two were letting go of their traumatic pasts and were now waking up at 5AM, setting great daily habits and experiencing the best productivity of their lives. Here, Riley coached the couple on the tactics of lifelong genius. The 90 90 one rule. 
for 90 days, schedule 90 minutes at the start of your workday to practice the most important skill for your field. The artist, for instance, could spend that 90 minutes on figure, landscape, and color studies. The 60 tenths method. The people who perform best in their fields know that they can't hold their attention on one task for an entire day. Instead, they work in cycles. Once you've completed your 90 minutes of practice, spend 60 minutes of intense focus on your work, followed by 10 minutes of total rest. Traffic University. Most people spend their commutes feeling bored or frustrated, but it doesn't have to be that way. The most successful people take advantage of this downtime by learning something. Audiobooks, lecture series, and educational podcasts are an excellent way to keep yourself stimulated and growing. The Weekly Design System. The things that you schedule into your week are the things that will get done, so set aside 30 minutes every Sunday to create your schedule. Give priority to the tasks that are the most important to you, and also schedule time to rest. Finally, Riley brought the artist and entrepreneur to South Africa to illustrate the twin cycles of elite performance. The high excellence cycle and the deep refueling cycle. The key to great leadership is that it must be sustainable over the long term. If you burn out too soon, you won't make as much of an impact on the world around you. Consider the fact that muscles don't grow during a workout, they grow during recovery. Similarly, your willpower and energy will grow each time you get true, deep rest. At least two days a week should be dedicated to intentional restoration with zero distraction from technology, and every quarter, you should take even more time off work to relax. You'll come back from these periods of rest regenerated and stronger. Conclusion Success for its own sake, or for the sake of money, isn't enough. Success is just a side effect of a greater goal. Changing the world. By forging your character in the fires of suffering and discomfort and using these to strengthen your natural talents, you can become the hero of your own life. This is true leadership. On your journey to heroism, remember the insights of the 5AM Club. 1. Four focuses of history makers. Improve upon your natural talents, free yourself from distractions, master your craft, and build each day's successes on the last. 2. Habit installation. To create new habits, choose a trigger, a ritual, and a reward. Then, turn your habits into triggers for further habits. 3. The 2020th 20 formula. The first hour of your day should be split into 20-minute pockets of intense exercise, reflection, and study. 4. The 90-90th 1 rule. For 90 days, spend 90 minutes at the start of your day practicing the one most important skill for your field. 5. The 60 tenths method. For stellar productivity, work in cycles of 60 minutes of intense focus and 10 minutes of deep rest. 6. Traffic University. Spend your commute learning instead of allowing yourself to succumb to boredom. 7. Weekly Design. The things you schedule are the things that will get done, so take 30 minutes every Sunday to design a beautiful week. This is the summary of The Year of Less, How I Stopped Shopping, Gave Away My Belongings, and Discovered Life is Worth More Than Anything You Can Buy in a Store, by Kate Flanders. Introduction Two days before Kate Flanders' 29th birthday, she and her friends were hiking the trails of Garibaldi Provincial Park. As they spoke of where their lives were taking them, Flanders had a revelation. While all her friends were moving into the next stages of life, she seemed stagnant and still in need of working on herself. When her friends asked what her next step would be, she blurted out an idea she'd been dwelling on for a while, she would stop all unnecessary shopping for an entire year. Flanders had made drastic life changes before, including combating alcoholism, obesity, and a large amount of debt. She'd spent her youth hiding dark secrets of being in debt and drinking from her family. While her struggle to relieve $30,000 of debt and distance herself from alcohol had been public triumphs, she feared her shopping experiment would crash and burn. But after a serious and revealing conversation with her younger sister, Flanders knew this drastic change was the only way to go. These were the rules Flanders set up for herself on this journey. 1. She was not allowed to buy new clothes, electronics, shoes, accessories, books, or home goods. 2. She could buy food, gas, and other consumables. 3. She could only shop from an approved shopping list. 4. She could replace things that were broken only if she threw away the original item. 5. She could not buy takeout coffee. While she assumed she would likely fail, Flanders still hit publish on her blog entry outlining the rules. 
throughout the following year, she would face some of the lowest lows of her life. Yet by holding herself accountable for a full year, she succeeded in making huge positive changes to her life. In her book The Year of Less, Flanders outlines each month of her year-long journey, and this summary provides insight into Flanders' trials and triumphs during several of those months. Through her journey, you can learn to live your own life of less. July, Taking Inventory Flanders was always a neat freak, which made her shopping problem less apparent to herself and others. It wasn't until 2014 that she began losing objects she owned. It was while she looked for missing objects that she first noticed all the things she owned but didn't really need, five black tank tops, multiple bottles of the same lotion, many never-worn clothing items with the price tags still on. Much like her original struggles with debt and alcoholism, Flanders tried to ignore the ensuing clutter until she absolutely couldn't avoid it any longer. But rather than a sudden aha moment, it was her inability to find a can opener that triggered her journey. After the 100th time of thinking that she should get rid of some things, she finally did, so one July afternoon, shortly after starting the shopping ban. She started with her closet and quickly determined that she only wore roughly 15% of the clothes she owned. Then, she realized that she owned more books than she could ever read. And in her bathroom, she discovered she needed to get rid of roughly half the toiletries she'd collected over the years. By the time Flanders finished clearing out her apartment, she'd gotten rid of almost half of her belongings. Suddenly, she felt lighter, as if her home belonged more to her than it had before. She knew, however, that the work ahead of her would only get harder. This was just a first step in her year-long quest to consume less. August, Changing Daily Habits The first time Flanders got drunk was with her biological father. He showed up in her life when she was 12, asking to take her out for ice cream. But ice cream soon turned into alcohol, leading her down a path that would haunt her for years. As a child, she viewed her drunken experience as a rite of passage, a tool to make her popular among her peers. She never found a niche doing anything else, so partying and getting drunk became her way of bonding with her friends. But as she grew, her troubles with alcohol grew as well. She tried to quit drinking multiple times. Her first attempt came after a blackout, which led to her being picked up on the street by her friend's parents. The thought of potential strangers kidnapping her off the street scared her enough to stop drinking for several weeks. But it didn't last. After job losses, relationship breakups, and other big life changes, Flanders found herself returning to the bottle again and again. It wasn't until the age of 27 when an epiphany finally stopped Flanders drinking. Then, Flanders' vice turned to take out coffee. While certainly less problematic than drinking, it was very expensive. Two months into her shopping ban, Flanders discovered just how much she was spending on her coffee habit. Much like her journey to alcohol recovery, she realigned her thinking and focused on the triggers that caused her craving rather than immediately giving into it. By confronting these triggers, both with coffee and shopping in general, she forced herself to think about and soothe the negative thoughts fueling her desire to buy. As it turns out, her spending was based in emotions far more than she'd originally thought. September breaking up with retail therapy. While Flanders could acknowledge her compulsions with alcohol and food, it took much longer to realize the serious problem she had with shopping. Her major trigger was breakups. After a seemingly positive relationship ended suddenly, she found herself in a shopping spiral, adding up clothes, home goods, and office supplies to her online shopping carts, as if these things could comfort her. But then, unexpectedly, Flanders stopped herself before she hit buy. She knew that before the shopping ban, she would have bought it all, because she had done that very thing before. But this time, instead of drinking, binging, and shopping, she turned to decluttering, went out with friends, and kept on living, even in the face of sadness. November, blacking out and coming to. Flanders soon found that it was difficult to block herself from all advertisements. By switching from cable television to streaming shows, clearing out her email, and avoiding print ads, she was able to avoid a good deal of temptation, but not all of it. On Black Friday, one specific advertisement slipped through the cracks. At first, it seemed like a blessing. Flanders was running a giveaway of an ear eater on her blog, and the advertisement was for ear eaters at a reduced price. But soon, the voice in her head began whispering to her about her own old ear eater she could get rid of it and replace it with a new one without technically breaking her rules. It wasn't until she received the confirmation email that her choice hit home, she'd bought two ear eaters instead of one. Much like her drinking days, Flanders had blacked out and then did something she regretted. 
she felt herself slipping back into binging habits as she fought the urge to continue breaking the ban with more purchases. But instead of going into a binge or a shame spiral, Flanders used love and logic to confront the feelings she was having. She quickly emailed the store and canceled her purchase of the second year eater. She was honest with herself about the fact that she couldn't simply avoid all temptation, and now, she knew that the change she was seeking had to come from within. January, rewriting the rules. January was shaping up to be a quiet month. As Flanders helped friends declutter their own lives, she learned more about who they were, and in the process, she learned more about herself. She discovered that she wanted to explore her own creativity. Her parents were both creative, they had to be with a limited budget and three children. Her mother sewed, her father built, and both parents gardened food for the family. As Flanders thought about what her family's legacy meant, her sister called her to tell her the news, she thought their parents were getting a divorce. At first, Flanders couldn't believe it, and she immediately rushed over to pay a surprise visit to her parents, who seemed fine. But as the possibility of divorce crashed over her, Flanders regretted all the time she had wasted not learning from her parents. So, she made a decision. Instead of dwelling on the possibility of a divorce, Flanders took time to talk to her parents and relatives and learn from them. She learned about sewing, gardening, repairs, and a ton of other things, and she even amended her approved shopping list to encourage her new self-improvement endeavors. February, letting go of the future. After returning from a trip to New York City, Flanders visited her parents and found proof. Her parents were splitting up. Depression hit her hard. And she credited her ability to save so much money during this month to her refusal to leave the house. Bedtimes got earlier each day, and work and creative endeavors were pushed aside. The divorce became all-consuming. It wasn't until she was trying to work from her bed that she realized how depressed she'd become, and she immediately got angry with herself. In a fit, she began the decluttering once more. Though this spree far from cured her of her depression, it was an important first step on her journey to accepting the situation. March, lightening up. Flanders still slept too late and went to bed too early. She still avoided friends' texts. She thought about drinking again as she battled the overwhelming depression. She even slipped back into eating as a comfort mechanism. Eventually, a friend called her out on her behavior, and Flanders began to turn herself around. Instead of ignoring the problem or quitting cold turkey, she started tracking her eating and television use. Soon, she vowed to stop watching anything not educational and limited herself to podcasts and audiobooks. With her newly found time, she focused on things that took her mind off the divorce, reading, writing, researching, etc. She discovered mindfulness, which made the things she did do more meaningful. By living without things, Flanders finally discovered what she truly needed. May, finding myself in unusual places. At the 10-month mark, Flanders found her shopping triggers to be completely numbed. Now, she could control herself and her spending, and with her new creativity, she also had the option to make or repair her belongings. The month of May was filled with travel, but every trip had a purpose. While her first trip was business-related, her second trip was to talk with her brother about the divorce. His maturity in the situation soothed her, and many of her worries dissipated. Her final trip was the first vacation she'd taken in the three years at her job. It was a 10-day road trip in the U.S., starting with New York City. As she saw musicals, visited museums, and walked through the city, Flanders realized this could be a step on the journey toward her dream career as a freelance writer. It was time for Flanders to quit her job, which she'd been considering for a while, and strike out on a new path. She called her boss and gave her the news that she would be leaving her job. When the shopping ban ended, Flanders would be free to follow her new path. June, packing up and moving on. While the final month of the shopping ban came with uncertainty, it was the uncertainty of a new path in life. Flanders had proven to herself that she could beat her shopping triggers. Not only had she defeated alcoholism, tackled debt, and dealt with binge eating, she had finally conquered those socially acceptable addictions that affect so many people. Now, she was giving up the comforts of boredom and stability to strike out on her own on a path that made her happy. She realized she didn't need objects to be content with her life. She was enough, just the way she was. Conclusion Throughout the year of less, Flanders spent 51% of her income on things she needed, spent 18% on travel, and saved the remaining 31%. She proved to herself that she could live a fulfilling life while still saving and being mindful of her income. 
She also discovered that much of her shopping was influenced by the same triggers that fueled her prior addictions. One of the greatest things Flanders took away from this experiment was that most people, herself included, use shopping to avoid other negative feelings. By confronting and dealing with the feelings that trigger those actions and addictions, you too can begin living your own life of less. This is the summary of Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Introduction. The human mind often gets in the way of human success. Too many people fill their minds with self-defeating beliefs and give up at the first sign of challenge or defeat. But you needn't operate this way. By channeling your desire, your emotions, and your knowledge toward the attainment of wealth, you can think and grow rich. Keep in mind these key aspects of growing rich. 1. Desire. All great achievements start with a burning, intense desire. 2. Faith. To make plans toward your wealth, you must have faith in yourself. 3. Auto-suggestion. By repeating affirmations, you can increase your faith in yourself. 4. Specialized knowledge. To succeed wildly, you need to have more specialized knowledge than anyone in your field. 5. Imagination. Imagination is what turns your desire into plans. 6. Power. Power is organized effort. A group of people working harmoniously toward one goal. 7. Decision. The most successful people make quick decisions based on predetermined values. 8. Emotion. Emotions. Especially sexual emotion. Create the energy you need to carry your plans through to completion. Desire. The starting point of all achievement. The essential ingredient to success is an intense, burning desire to succeed. You can create money consciousness by practicing the following six steps. 1. Choose the exact amount of money you wish to possess. 2. Decide what you're going to give in return for that amount of money. 3. Set the exact date at which you will possess that amount. 4. Design a detailed plan for how you're going to acquire your wealth. 5. Write out that plan. 6. Read that plan aloud to yourself twice daily. As you read, visualize yourself with that money and see yourself already in possession of it. By doing so, you'll orient your brain toward your success. On the way to riches, you must be open-minded to new ideas and never let anyone discourage you from your path. Perhaps your dream is far-fetched, so was Thomas Edison's when he foresaw a world that ran on electricity. Fuel your own desire, set yourself on your path, and prepare yourself to receive the wealth you desire. Faith visualization of, and belief in, attainment of desire. It's possible to induce a feeling of faith, even if you don't naturally possess it. The key is repeating affirmations to yourself. As you repeat affirming thoughts to yourself, you'll begin to believe them, even if you believe they're unmerited or unrealistic at first. These affirmations will affect your subconsciousness, which in turn will guide your actions toward wealth. There are five insights to increase your faith in yourself. 1. You have the ability to achieve your purpose and can demand of yourself that you take action toward it. 2. Your thoughts become actions. Therefore, it is crucial that you spend 30 minutes each day focusing on thoughts that lead to your goals. 3. Any thought that you consistently repeat to yourself will eventually be realized. 4. You must know and write down your exact aim in life and never stop trying to achieve it. 5. Any goal you set for yourself must be right and just, or it won't be sustainable in the long term. Repeat these insights to yourself aloud, daily. If you doubt yourself at all, remember that even Abraham Lincoln failed repeatedly for the first four decades of his life. Only through persistent effort did he reach the legal and political success he achieved in his 40s. Auto-suggestion. The medium for influencing the subconscious mind. Auto-suggestion is self-communication, the repetition of affirmations that will lead you to adopt a wealth-oriented mindset. Whatever negative thoughts you possess in your head right now, you possess because you repeated them to yourself so consistently that you adopted them as your beliefs. Likewise, you can repeat new thoughts to yourself until you believe them too. Remember, you have control over your own mind. The key to auto-suggestion is to intentionally mix these new thoughts with emotion through visualization. To revisit Abraham Lincoln. Part of what led to his success late in life was his love for Mary Todd, who would one day become his wife. His love for her motivated him to adopt new ways of thinking and new strategies for success. Without a strong emotion tied to your new thoughts, you won't be as motivated to act upon them. Specialized knowledge. Personal experience or observation. The organization and application of your knowledge will be key to your success. 
Many people have knowledge but don't organize it into a plan they can execute. Your desire on its own isn't enough. This is why, earlier, you were asked to describe the exact price you would pay for wealth and design a plan by which you would acquire it. Specifically, you need specialized knowledge of a product, service, or profession. In fact, you need much more specialized knowledge than anyone else in your field. Take Warren Buffett as an example. Early in his career, investors were consistently impressed with how much more he knew about their businesses than anyone else would have bothered to learn. His deep well of specialized knowledge was what gained their confidence. Knowledge in itself isn't power, well-organized, highly specialized knowledge is power. Whether you gain specialization through your experience, a school, a network, a library, or training courses, you must acquire as much specialized knowledge as possible in your field. Imagination. The workshop of the mind. A human being's limits and freedoms are determined by one thing alone. Their imagination. There are two kinds of imagination synthetic and creative. Synthetic imagination consists of arranging pre-existing concepts and applying them in new ways to new fields or new problems. Creative imagination, on the other hand, produces entirely new ideas. Creative imagination is automatic and involuntary and is most productive when the rest of the brain is energetic. This is where hunches and inspiration arise. You'll need your imagination running at full capacity to create your plans. By writing out your plan, you will have created something entirely new something that didn't exist before. In the end, your imagination will turn your desire into physical action. Organize planning. The crystallization of desire into action. There are four steps to take to bring your plan into concrete reality. 1. Decide what benefits you can offer people who want to help you succeed in return for their help. 2. Surround yourself with a large number of capable and intelligent people who want to help you carry out your plan. This is your mastermind group. 3. Meet with your mastermind group at least twice a week until you have perfected your plan. 4. Maintain good relationships with these people at all costs. One soured relationship can lead to failure. Decision. The mastery of procrastination. The most successful people in the world are in the habit of making decisions quickly and changing them slowly. If they ever change them at all. To make quick decisions, you need to have a set of personal principles in place on which you can rely in any situation. Do not let anyone else's opinion sway you from this set of principles, it will only delay your decision making, not improve it. These principles are the antidote to procrastination. Persistence. The sustained effort necessary to induce faith. The foundation of persistence is willpower. Most people give up on their goals as soon as they face opposition or obstacles, but persistence and willpower are what separate the most successful people from others. Howard Schultz, the longtime CEO of Starbucks, was rejected by hundreds of investors before he raised enough money to expand the business. Persistence and willpower built his empire. To build your persistence, cut yourself off from all discouraging influences in your life and surround yourself with those who encourage and have faith in you. Your mastermind group is crucial to building your persistence. Power of the mastermind. The driving force. Power is organized effort. When you can coordinate others toward your own goals, you have true power. Organized effort is what turns your desire into monetary wealth. You'll organize your efforts through your mastermind group. The mastermind group has two features. One economic and one psychic. One. The economic benefit of a mastermind group is that it provides you with more knowledge and energy with which to accelerate your plans toward completion. Two. The psychic benefit of the mastermind group is that, by combining the energies of many minds, a sort of third mind arises that embodies the whole group. For just one example of this phenomenon, consider the Second Continental Congress, who, by working together to draft the Declaration of Independence, created an entirely new entity. The United States of America. The mystery of sex. Transmutation. You've learned that thoughts must be mixed with emotion to be effective. The most powerful emotion is sex. There is no more potent energy in the world. Sex is so deeply ingrained in the human psyche because, without it, the human race would not exist. Sex creates a wellspring of energy that you can transmute into organized effort toward your wealth. If it's used correctly. Most people spend their early lives wasting their sexual emotion on the act of intercourse itself. It's not until their 40s or 50s that they truly achieve anything great because they've thrown away too much of their effort on sexual congress. While the appetite for the sex act declines, the amount of sexual energy does not. It's merely channeled toward greater purposes. If you're young, use your sexual energy to bring your mind to a higher state of vibration. 
It is the true road to genius. The brain. A broadcasting and receiving station for thought. The way in which the third mind is created in the master mind group is by vibration. Thought vibrations at a very higher rate. Like that caused by the emotion of sex. Are carried from one brain to another. The brain, then, acts like a broadcasting device. Not only does your brain transmit a broadcast to others, but your brain also becomes more open to others' thoughts and ideas, fueling your creative imagination. This is where the power of auto-suggestion multiplies. When you filled your mind with affirming beliefs, you can broadcast your ideas to others, while better using the creative imagination to make your plans. Conclusion. Your mind is the only thing that stands between you and the riches you desire. Insofar as you have control over the information you repeat to yourself, the beliefs that you choose, and the values upon which you base decisions, you have the power to actualize your desires into monetary gain. Remember these key elements of growing rich. 1. Desire. All great achievements start with a burning, intense desire. 2. Faith. To make plans toward your wealth, you must have faith in yourself. 3. Auto-suggestion. By repeating affirmations, you can increase your faith in yourself. 4. Specialized knowledge. To succeed wildly, you need to have more specialized knowledge than anyone in your field. 5. Imagination. Imagination is what turns your desire into plans. 6. Power. Power is organized effort. A group of people working harmoniously toward one goal. 7. Decision. The most successful people make quick decisions based on predetermined values. 8. Emotion. Emotions. Especially sexual emotion. Create the energy you need to carry your plans through to completion.